everyone. Thank you for joining me today. It's hard to believe, but today we are going to finish the last three chapters of the BFG. Um, so if you remember, let's see, where did we leave off last week? The BFG and Sophie were having breakfast with the queen. Remember the BF BFG ate how many eggs? I think 72 eggs um, and donuts and bacon and tons of other stuff. And they ran out of food and they came up with a plan to get the big, the other mean giants, right? They were gonna come up with a plan with the army. Remember that? So let's get started. And thank you to Penguin Random House for allowing me to share this book with you. I had so much fun reading this and I'm excited to see how it ends. So the next chapter is called The Plan, and let's see what their plan is going to be. The head of the army and the head of the Air Force stood at attention beside the queen's breakfast table. Sophie was still in her seat, and the BFG was still high up on his crazy perch. It took the queen only five minutes to explain the situation to the military men. I knew there was something like this going on, your majesty, the head of the army said. For the last 10 years, we have get, been getting reports from nearly every country in the world about people disappearing mysteriously in the night. We had one only the other day from Panama for the hottie taste, cried the BFG, and one from Wellington in New Zealand, said the head of the army. For the booty flavor, said the BFG. What is he talking about? said the head of the Air Force. Work it out for yourself, the Queen said. What time is it? 10 a.m.? In eight hours, those nine bloodthirsty brutes will be galloping off to gobble up another couple dozen unfortunate wretches. They have to be stopped. We must act fast. We'll bomb the blighters, shouted the head of the Air Force. We'll mow them down, cried the head of the Army. I do not approve of murder, the Queen said. But they are murderers themselves, cried the head of the army. That is no reason why we should follow their example, the queen said. Two wrongs don't make a right. And two rights don't make a left, cried the BFG. We must bring them back alive, the queen said. How, the two military men said together. They are all 50 feet high. They'd knock us down like nine pins. Wait, cried the BFG. Hold your horse flies. Keep your skirts on. I think I has the answer to the maiden's hair. Let him speak, the queen said. Every afternoon, the BFG said, all these giants is in the land of naughty. I can't understand a word this feller says, the head of the army snapped. Why doesn't he speak clearly? He means the land of nod, Sophie said. It's pretty obvious. Exactly, cried the BFG. Every afternoon, all these nine giants is lying on the ground, snoozling away in a very deep sleep. They is always resting like that before they is galloping off to guzzle another helping of human beings. Go on, they said. So what? So what you soldiers has to do is to creep up on the giants while they is still in the land of naughty and tie their arms and legs with mighty ropes and wonky chains. Brilliant, the queen said. That's all very well, said the head of the army, but how do we get the brutes back here? We can't load 50 foot giants onto trucks. Shoot them on the spot, that's what I say. The BFG looked down from his lofty perch and said this time to the head of the Air Force, you is having belly poppers, is you not? Is he being rude, the head of the Air Force said. He means helicopters, Sophie told him. Then why doesn't he say so? Of course we have helicopters. Wopsy big belly poppers, asked the BFG. Very big ones, the head of the Air Force said proudly, but no helicopter is big enough to get a giant like that inside it. You do not put him inside, the BFG said. You sling him underneath the belly of your belly popper and carry him like a portito. Like a what, said the head of the Air Force. Like a torpedo, Sophie said. Could you do that, Air Marshal, the Queen asked. 
Well, I suppose we could, the head of the Air Force admitted grudgingly. Then get cracking, the queen said. You'll need nine helicopters, one for each giant. Hmm, do you think this plane is going to work? Where is this place, the Air Force man said to the BFG. I presume you can pinpoint it on a map. Pinpoint, said the BFG. Map? I is never hearing these words before. Is this Air Force being talking slush bungle? The Air Marshal's face turned the color of a ripe plum. He was not used to being told he was talking slush bungle. The Queen, with her usual admirable tact and good sense, came to the rescue. BFG, she said, can you tell us more or less where this giant country is? No, Magister, the BFG said, not on my Nelly. Then we're jiggered, cried the Army General. This is ridiculous, cried the Air Marshal. You must not be giving up so easy, the BFG said calmly. The first titchy bobstickle you meet, and you begin shouting you was Biff Squiggle? The Army General was no more used to being insulted than the Air Marshal. His face began to swell with fury, and his cheeks blew out until they looked like two huge ripe tomatoes. Your Majesty, he cried, we are dealing with a lunatic. I want nothing more to do with this ridiculous operation. The queen, who was used to the tantrums of her senior officials, ignored him completely. BFG, she said, would you please tell these rather dim-witted characters exactly what to do? A pleasure, Magister, said the BFG. Now listen to me carefully, you two boot bogglers. The military men began to twitch, but they stayed put. I is not having the foggy idea where giant country is in the world, the BFG said but I is always able to gallop there. I is galloping forthwards and backwards from giant country every night to blow my dreams into little Chidler's bedrooms. I is knowing the way very well. So all you is having to do is this, put your nine big belly hoppers up in the air and let them follow me as I is galloping along. How long will the journey take, the queen asked. If we is leaving now, the BFG said, we will be arriving just as the giants is having their afternoon snozzle. Splendid, said the queen. Then turning to the two military men, she said, prepare to leave immediately. The head of the army, who was feeling pretty miffed by the whole business, said, that's all very well, your majesty, but what are we going to do with the blighters once we've got them back? Don't you worry about that, the queen told him. It will be ready for them. Hurry up now, off you go. If it pleases your majesty, Sophie said, I should like to ride with the BFG to keep him company. Well, where will you sit? asked the queen. Remember where she sits? In his ear, Sophie said. Show them, BFG. The BFG got down from his high chair. He picked Sophie up in his fingers and he swiveled his huge right ear until it was parallel with the ground and then he placed Sophie gently inside it. The heads of the army and the Air Force stood there goggling. The queen smiled. You really are a rather wonderful giant, she said. I think he's wonderful too, don't you? Magister, the BFG said, I is wishing to ask a very special thing from you. What is it, the queen said. Could I please bring back here in the belly poppers all my collection of dreams. They is taking me years and years to collect and I is not wanting to lose them. Why, of course, the queen said. I wish you a safe journey. The BFG had made thousands of journeys to and from giant country over the years, but he had never in his life made one quite like this with nine huge helicopters roaring along just over his head. He had never before traveled in broad daylight either. He hadn't dared to. And here's a picture of all the helicopters going to giant country. But this was different. Now he was doing it for the Queen of England herself and he was frightened of nobody. As he galloped across the British Isles with the helicopters thundering above him, people stood and gaped and wondered what on earth was going on. They had never seen the likes of it before. 
and they never would again. Every now and then, the pilots of the helicopters would catch a glimpse of a small girl wearing glasses, crouching in the giant's right ear and waving to them. They always waved back. The pilots marveled at the giant's speed and at the way he leapt across wide rivers and over huge houses, but they hadn't seen anything yet. Be careful to hang on tight, the BFG said. We is going fast as a fizzle crump. The BFG changed into his famous top gear and all at once he began to fly forward as though there were springs in his legs and rockets in his toes. He went skimming over the earth like some magical hop, skip, and jumper with his feet hardly ever touching the ground. As usual, as usual, Sophie had to crouch low in the crevice of his ear to save herself from being swept clean away. The nine pilots in their helicopters suddenly realized they were being left behind. The giant was streaking ahead. They opened their throttles to full speed, and even then they were only just able to keep up. In the leading machine, the head of the Air Force was sitting beside the pilot. He had a world atlas on his knees and he kept staring first at the atlas, then at the ground below and trying to figure out where they were going. Frantically, he turned the pages of the atlas. Where the devil are we going, he said. I haven't the foggiest idea, the pilot answered. The queen's orders were to follow the giant and that's exactly what I'm doing. The pilot was a young Air Force officer with a bushy mustache. He was very proud of his mustache, and he was also quite fearless, and he loved adventure. He thought this was a super adventure. It's fun going to new places, he said. New places, shot at the head of the Air Force. What the blazes do you mean, new places? This place we're flying over now isn't in the Atlas, is it? The pilot said, grinning. You're darn right it isn't in the Atlas, cried the head of the Air Force. We've flown clear off the last page. I expect that old giant knows where he's going, the young pilot said. He's leading us into disaster, cried the head of the Air Force. He was shaking with fear, and in the seat behind him sat the head of the Army, who was even more terrified. You don't mean to tell me we've gone right out of the Atlas, he cried, leaning forward to look. That's exactly what I am telling you, cried the Air Force man. Look for yourself. Here's the very last map in the whole flaming atlas. We went off that over an hour ago. He turned the page. As in all atlases, there were two completely blank pages at the very end. So now we must be somewhere here, he said, putting a finger on one of the blank pages. Where's here, cried the head of the army. The young pilot was still grinning broadly. He said to them, that's why they always put two blank pages at the back of the atlas. They're for new countries. You're meant to fill them in yourself. The head of the Air Force glanced down at the ground below. Just look at this godforsaken desert, he cried. All the trees are dead and all the rocks are blue. The giant has stopped, the young pilot said. He's waving us down. The pilots throttled back the engines and all nine helicopters landed safely on the great yellow wasteland. Then each of them lowered a ramp from its belly. Nine jeeps, one from each helicopter, were driven down the ramps. Each jeep contained six soldiers and a vast quantity of thick rope and heavy chains. I don't see any giants, the head of the army said. The giants is all just out of sight over there, the BFG told him. But if you is taking these, these slosh buckling noisy belly poppers any closer, all the giants is waking up at once and then pop goes the weasel. So you want us to proceed by Jeep, the head of the army said? Yes, the BFG said, but you must all be very hushy quiet. No roaring of motors, no shouting, no mucking about, no piggery jokery. The BFG with Sophie still in his ear trotted forward and the jeeps followed close behind. Suddenly, the most dreadful rumbling noise was heard by everyone. The head of the army went pea green in the face. Those are guns, he cried. There is a battle raging somewhere up ahead of us. Turn back the lot of you, let's get out of here. Pig spiffle, the BFG said. Those noises is not guns. What do you think those noises are? Hmm, let's see. 
Of course there are guns shot at the head of the, the army. I am a military man and I know a gun when I hear one. Turn back. Those is just the giants snortling in their sleep, the BFG said. I is a giant myself and I know a giant snortle when I hear one. Are you quite sure, the army man said anxiously. Positive, the BFG said. Proceed cautiously, the army man ordered. They all moved on, and then they saw them. Even at a distance, they were enough to scare the daylights out of the soldiers. But when they got close and saw what the giants really looked like, they began to sweat with fear. Nine fearsome, ugly, half-naked, 50 feet long brutes lay sprawled over the ground in various grotesque attitudes of sleep, and the sound of their snoring was indeed like gunfire in a battle. The BFG raised a hand, the jeeps all stopped, and the soldiers got out. What happens if one of them wakes up, whispers the army man, his knees knocking together from fear. If any of them is waking up, he will gobble you down before you can say, Nap jife, the BFG answered, grinning hugely. Me is the only one won't be gobbled up because giants is never eating giants. Me and Sophie is the only safe ones because I is hiding her if that happens. The head of the army took several paces to the rear. So did the head of the Air Force. They climbed rather quickly back into their Jeep, ready to make a fast getaway if necessary. Go forward, men, the head of the army said. Go forward and do your duty bravely. The soldiers crept forward with their ropes and chains. All of them were trembling mightily, and none dared speak a word. The BFG, with Sophie now sitting on the palm of his hand, stood nearby watching their operation. To give the soldiers their due, they were extremely courageous. There were six well-trained, efficient men working on each giant, and within 10 minutes, eight out of, not, eight out of the nine giants had been trussed up like chickens and were still snoring contentedly. The ninth, who happened to be the flesh lump eater, was causing trouble for the soldiers because he was lying with his right arm tucked underneath his enormous body. It was impossible to tie his wrists and arms together without first getting that arm out from underneath him. Very, very cautiously, the six soldiers who were working on the flesh lump eater began to pull at the huge arm trying to release it. The flesh lump eater opened his tiny piggy black eyes. Which of you foul pesters is wiggling my arm, he bellowed. Is that you, you rotten man hugger? Suddenly he saw the soldiers. In a flash, he was sitting up. He looked around him and he saw more soldiers. With a roar, he leapt to his feet. The soldiers, petrified with fear, froze where they were. They had no weapons with them. The head of the army put his jeep in reverse. Human beans, the flesh lump eater yelled. What is all you flesh bunking rot some half-baked beans doing in our country? He made a grab at a soldier and swept him up in his hand. I is having early suppers today, he shouted, holding the poor squirming soldier at arm's length and roaring with laughter. And here's a picture of him. That's the flesh lump eater. Remember him? Sophie, standing on the palm of the BFG's hand, was watching, horror-struck. Do something, she cried, quick before he eats him. Put that human being down, the BFG shouted. The flesh lump eater turned and stared at the BFG. What is you doing here with all these grotty twiglets, he bellowed. You is making me very suspicious. The BFG made a rush at the flesh lump eater but the colossal 54 foot high giant simply knocked him over with a flick of his free arm. At the same time, Sophie fell off the BFG's palm on the ground. Her mind was racing. She must do something. She must, she must. She then remembered the sapphire brooch the queen had pinned onto her chest and quickly she undid it. I is guzzling you nice and slow, the flesh lump eater was saying to the soldier in his hand. Then I is guzzling 10 or 20 more of you midgy little maggots down there. You is not getting away from me because I is galloping 50 times faster than you. Sophie ran up behind the flesh lump eater and she was holding the brooch between her fingers. When she was right up close to the great hairy legs, 
she rammed the three inch long pin of the brooch as hard as she could into the flesh lump eater's right ankle. It was deep into the flesh and it stayed there. The giant gave a roar of pain and jumped high in the air. He dropped the soldier and made a grab for his ankle. The BFG, knowing what a coward the flesh lump eater was, saw his chance. You was bitten by a snake, he shouted. I seed it biting you. It was a frightsome poison mouse viper. It was dreadly dangerous vidscreen viper. Save our souls, bellowed the flesh lump eater. Sound the crumpets. I is bitten by a septitious venomous vidscreen viper. He flopped to the ground and sat there howling his head off and clutching his ankle with both hands. His fingers felt the brooch. The teeth of the deadly viper, it's still sticking into me, he yelled. I is feeling the teeth sticking into my anklet. The BFG saw his second chance. We must be getting those viper's teeth out at once, he cried. Otherwise, you was deader than duck soup. I is helping you. The BFG knelt down beside the flesh lump eater. You must grab your anklet very tight with both hands, he ordered. That will stop the poison mouse juices from the venomous viper going up into your leg and into your heart. The flesh lump eater grabbed his ankle with both hands. Now close your eyes and griddle your teeth and look up to heaven and say your prayers while I is taking out the teeth of the venomous viper, the BFG said. The terrified, the terrified flesh lump eater did exactly as he was told. The BFG signaled for some rope. A soldier rushed it over to him. With both the flesh lump eater's hands gripping his ankle, it was a simple matter for the BFG to tie the ankles and hands together with a tight knot. I is pulling out the frightsome viper's teeth, the BFG said as he pulled the knot tight. Do it quickly, shouted the flesh lump eater, before I is pissed to death. There we is, said the BFG standing up. You can look now. When the flesh lump eater saw that he was trussed up like a turkey, he gave a yell so loud that the heavens trembled. He rolled and he wriggled. He fought and he figgled. He squirmed and he squiggled, but there was not a thing he could do. Well done you, Sophie cried. Well done you, said the BFG, smiling down at the little girl. You is saving all of our lives. Will you please get that brooch back for me, Sophie said. It belongs to the queen. The BFG pulled the beautiful brooch out of the flesh lump eater's ankle. The flesh lump eater howled. The BFG wiped the pin and handed it back to Sophie. Curiously, not one of the other eight snoring giants had woken up during this schmazzle. When you was only sleeping one or two hours a day, you was sleeping extra doubly deep, the BFG explained. <coughs> The heads of the army and the air force drove forward once again in their jeep. Her majesty will be very pleased with me, the head of the army said. I shall probably get a medal. What's the next move? Now you was all driving over to my cave to load up my bottle of dreams, the BFG said. We can't waste time with that rubbish, the army general said. It is the queen's order, Sophie said. She was now back on the BFG's hand. So the nine jeeps drove across to the BFG's cave and the great dream loading operation began. There were 50,000 jars in all to, load, to be loaded up, more than 5,000 to each jeep, and it took over an hour to finish the job. While the soldiers were loading the dreams, the BFG and Sophie disappeared over the mountains on a mysterious errand. When they came back, the BFG had a sack the size of a small house slung over his shoulder. What's that you've got in there? The head of the army demanded to know. Curiosity is killing the rat, the BFG said, and he turned away from the silly man. When he was sure that all his precious dreams had been safely loaded onto the jeeps, the BFG said, now we is driving back to the belly poppers and picking up the frightsome giants. The jeeps drove back to the helicopters the 50,000 dreams were carried carefully, jar by jar, onto the helicopters. The soldiers climbed back on board, but the BFG and Sophie stayed on the ground. Then they all returned to where the nine giants were lying. It was a fine sight to see them, these great air machines hovering over the trussed up giants. And here's a picture of that.
it was an even finer sight to see the giants being woken up by the terrific thundering of the engines overhead. And the finest sight of all was to observe these nine hideous brutes squirming and twisting about on the ground like a mass of mighty snakes as they tried to free themselves from their ropes and chains. I is flesh buckled, roared the flesh lump eater. I is splits wiggled, yelled the child chewer. I is swog swalloped, bellowed the bone cruncher. I is goose gruggled, howled the man hugger. I is gunzel swipe, shouted the meat dripper. I is fluck gungled, screamed the maid masher. I is slop groggled, squawked the gizzard golfer. I is crod swinkled, yelled the blood bottler. I is bot muggered, screeched the butcher boy. They're not very happy, are they? The nine giant carrying helicopters each chose a separate giant and hovered directly over him. Very strong steel housers with hooks on the ends of them were lowered from the front and the rear of each helicopter. The BFG quickly secured the hooks to the giant's chains, one hook near the legs and the other near the arms. Then very slowly, the giants were winched up into the air parallel with the ground. The giants roared and bellowed, but there was nothing they could do. The BFG, with Sophie once more resting comfortably in his ear, set off at a gallop for England. The helicopters all banked around and followed after him. It was an amazing spectacle, those nine helicopters winging through the sky, each with a trussed up 50 foot long giant slung underneath it. The giants themselves must have found it an interesting experience. They never stopped bellowing, but their howls were drowned by the noise of the engines. When it began to get dark, the helicopters switched on powerful searchlights and tra trained them onto the galloping giants so as to keep him in sight. They flew right through the night and arrived in England just as dawn was breaking. While the giants were being captured, a tremendous bustle and hustle was going on back home in England. Every earth digger and mechanical contrivance in the country had been mobilized to dig the colossal hole in which the nine giants were to be permanently imprisoned. 10,000 men and 10,000 machines worked ceaselessly through the night under powerful arc lights and the massive task was completed only just in time. The hole itself was about twice the size of a football field and 500 feet deep. The walls were perpendicular and engineers had calculated that there was no way a giant could escape once he was put in. Even if all nine giants were to stand on each other's shoulders, the topmost giant would still be some 50 feet from the top hole. The nine giant carrying helicopters hovered over the massive pit. The giants, one by one, were lowered to the floor, but they were still trussed up and now came the tricky business of releasing them from their bonds. Nobody wanted to go down and do this because the moment a giant was freed, he would be sure to turn on the wretched person who had freed him and gobble him up. As usual, the BFG had the answer. I has told you before, he said, giants is never eating giants, so I is going down and I shall untie them myself before you can say Rack Jobinson. With thousands of fascinated spectators, including the queen, peering down into the pit, the BFG was lowered on a rope. One by one, he released the giants. They stood up, stretched their stiffened limbs, and started leaping about in fury. Why is they putting us down here in this grob sledging hole, they shot at the BFG. Because you is guzzling human beings, the BFG answered. I is always warning you not to do it, and you is never taking the titchiest bit of notice. In that case, the flesh lump eater bellowed, I think we is guzzling you instead. The BFG grabbed the dangling rope and was hoisted out of the pit just in time. The great bulging sack he had brought back with him from giant country lay at the top of the pit. What's in there, the queen asked him. The BFG put an arm into the sack and pulled out a gigantic black and white striped object the size of a man. Snozcumbers, he cried. This is the repulsant Snozcumber, Magister, and that is all we is going to give these di disgustive giants from now on. May I taste it, the queen asked. Don't, Magister, don't, cried the BFG. It is tasting of trog filth and pig squibble. With that, he tossed the Snozcumber down to the giants below. There's your supper, he shouted. Have a munch on that. He fished out more snozcumbers from the sack and threw them down. The giants below howled and cursed. The BFG laughed. 
It serves them, it serves them right, left, and center, he said. What will we feed them on when the snaws cumbers are all used up? The queen asked him. They is never being used up, Magister, the BFG answered, smiling. I is also bringing in this sack a whole bunch bungle of snaws cumber plants, which I is giving, with your permission, to the royal gardener to put in the soil. Then we is having an everlasting supply of this repulsant food to feed these thirst bloody giants on. What a clever fellow you are, the queen said. You are not very well educated, but you are really nobody's fool. I can see that. And our last chapter is called The Author. Every country in the world that had in the past been visited by the foul man-eating giant sent telegrams of congratulations and thanks to the BFG and Sophie. Kings and presidents and prime ministers and rulers of every kind showered the enormous giant and the little girl with compliments and thank yous, as well as all sorts of medals and presents. The ruler of India sent the BFG a magnificent elephant, the very thing he had been wishing for all his life. Remember he said he wanted an elephant? The king of Arabia sent them a camel each. The Lama of Tibet sent them a llama each. Wellington sent them 100 pairs of wellies each and Panama sent them beautiful hats. The King of Sweden sent them a barrel full of sweet and sour pork. Jersey sent them pullovers. There was no end to the gratitude of the world. The queen herself gave orders that a special house with tremendous high ceilings and enormous doors should immediately be built in Windsor Great Park, next to her own castle for the BFG to live in. And a pretty little cottage was put up next door for Sophie. The BFG's house was to have a special dream storing room with hundreds of shelves in it where he could put his beloved bottles. What is more, he was given the title of the Royal, Royal Dream Blower. He was allowed to go galloping off to any place in England on any night of the year to blow his splendid fizz wizards in through the windows to sleeping children. And letters poured into his house by the million from children begging him to pay them a visit. Meanwhile, tourists from all over the globe came flocking to gaze down in wonder at the nine horrendous man-eating giants in the Great Pit. They came especially at feeding time, when the snozcumbers were being thrown down to them by the keeper, and it was a pleasure to listen to the howls and growls of horror coming up from the pit as the giants began to chew upon the filthiest tasting vegetable on earth. There was only one disaster. Three silly men who had drank too much beer for lunch decided to climb over the high fence surrounding the pit, and of course they fell in. There were yells of delight from the giants below, followed by the crunching of bones. The head keeper immediately put up a big notice on the fence saying, it is forbidden to feed the giants. And after that, there were no more disasters. The BFG expressed a wish to learn how to speak properly, and Sophie herself, who loved him as she would a father, volunteered to give him lessons every day. She even taught him how to spell and to write sentences, and he turned out to be a splendid, intelligent pupil. In his spare time, he read books. He became a tremendous reader. He read all of Charles Dickens, whom he no longer called Dolls Chickens, and all of Shakespeare and literally thousands of other books. He also started to write essays about his own past life. When Sophie read some of them, she said, these are very good. I think perhaps one day you could become a real writer. Oh, I would love that, cried the BFG. Do you think I could? I know you could, Sophie said. Why don't you start by writing a book about you and me? Very well, the BFG said. I'll give it a try. So he did. He worked hard on it, and in the end, he completed it. Rather shyly, he showed it to the queen. The queen read it aloud to her grandchildren. Then the queen said, I think we ought to get this book printed and properly and published so that other children can read it. This was arranged, but because the BFG was a very modest giant, he wouldn't put his own name on it. He used somebody else's name instead. But where? 
you might ask, is this book that the BFG wrote? It's right here. You just finished reading it. And there's the giant and Sophie. And that is the end of our story. That's the end of the BFG. I hope everyone enjoyed it. I enjoyed reading it to you. And if you liked this book, it's by Roald Dahl. And he has other books like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and Matilda. There's Matilda and Charlie and the Great Glass Elevator. Let's see what else is on here. James and the Giant Peach, Fantastic Mr. Fox. You might have seen those movies. So if you enjoyed this, read some more books by Roald Dahl. And once again, thank you for joining me, everybody. It was so much fun reading to you, and I hope you enjoyed it. Have a great week. Bye-bye.